And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read those texts that are on either side of the parable of the sower. And <clears throat> what I'd like to do is look at them in light now of the parable of the sower, particularly the, the fourth soil that we were looking at um, that I've already described this morning. We are going to do a brief review of what we saw in the parable. I don't want to reread the parable just for the sake of time. But um, anyway, I thought because there's certain themes that are revolving around this text that I would deal with it all through the parable of the sower. So this morning we're going to look at some of those things that will be true of us if we are the type of person described in the, the fourth of the soils, the, the good soil. We're going to also look um, next week at, um, and just touch on it this morning, um, the fact that there is a sower, right? That's one thing we haven't really looked at yet, um, and who it is that is to be sowing the word. We, we do want to look at probably the week following then at uh, what is sandwiched in, in this parable, which is um, essentially how one can actually respond to the word of God, uh, being given ears to hear and so forth. But this morning, we do want to focus on what it is that will be true of us if we are the good soil. And we'll look at it from that perspective. As you know, in, in the Bible, there's many different ways of saying the same thing. So we're going to look at this from two different perspectives, essentially. Um, what it means to be good soil, what is the fruit we're to be bearing, and um, what it means to be uh, the, the family of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that's another way of putting it, okay? And we'll see that uh, in uh, the later verses here. So let me read for us uh, verses 1 through 3 of Luke 8, and then verses 16 through 21. So beginning in verse 1. Soon afterwards, <clears throat> he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. Now, fast forwarding to verse 16. Uh, this is said now at the conclusion of the parable of the sower. Now no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has... To him, more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. And then verse 19 through 21. And his mother and brothers came to him. And they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. I think uh, you, you probably see the connection here of how all these things fit in the, uh, the four soil, uh, the good soil. So let's uh, begin first by considering what we looked at last time. Remember last time we were looking at the parable of the sower and we noted four responses to the gospel that correspond to four conditions of the heart. Now first there is the hard heart that is represented by the seed that fell along the path. Uh, we are reminded that this is what we are all like when we came into the world. We may not have thought we were like this, but we essentially, according to the Word of God, and if we know our own hearts well enough by now, we know that we hated God and we wanted nothing to do with Him. And in this state, we would never have believed the gospel. We never would have received Jesus. Our hearts needed to be changed. We needed to be born again by the Holy Spirit before we would believe. Now, as I've already said, we're going to look at that in the near future. But again, the hard heart. Secondly, there is the shallow heart that is represented by the seed that fell in the rocky soil. Uh, this refers to those who are awakened. Awakened by the Holy Spirit in what we call His common work. It's not His saving work. Awaken to their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they know that they are in danger. They may even answer an altar call. 
Uh, they may pray where they are to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They may believe that they have received him and be so basically so um, overwhelmed with happiness or joy that they're no longer going to have to face an eternity in hell that they begin to become very active for him. They just seem to take off and soar. And remember, we saw that because of the shallowness of the soil, the growth of the plant is upward. I think Jesus is talking about those who look like they're spectacular, perhaps super Christians. But they're the first ones, as we also saw, to crash and, and burn. Because when their faith is tested, when they have to suffer something for the gospel, they have to give up something perhaps they didn't want to give up or endure something they didn't want to endure. They're not willing to pay the price. And so they fall away. Thirdly, there is the worldly heart, the seed that fell among the thorns. Now, these are also awakened by the Spirit of God. They seem to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps join with the church, but somehow they just can't seem to let go of the world because they want the world. And so they never get down to serving Him and basically devoting their lives to Him in the way the Lord calls them to do. And then finally, there is the good and honest heart, the seed that fell in the good soil. These are those whose hearts and, and affections have been changed by the Holy Spirit. They receive the truth of God. They turn away from the world. They hold fast to Jesus. They trust in Him and they serve Him, as uh, Jesus tells us, bearing fruit with perseverance, practicing righteousness, doing what it is the Lord calls us all to do. Now, we looked at that basically just broadly last week. Um, and let me just mention this. Last week, we also noted that this was the only one of the four that actually represents salvation. The others fall short of that. I know there are many churches that would interpret the latter three soils as being saved, and those would be the ones that are primarily antinomians who think that you really don't have to change at all. If you, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Messiah and um, pray a prayer, and if you're sincere, you're saved. But that's not what Jesus is telling us because remember, he told us that everyone who is in him will bear fruit. Every branch in him bears fruit. The branches that don't are cut off and thrown into the fire. What's true about the first three soils? None of them bear any fruit. None of them are saved. There's no lasting change. The first isn't changed at all. The second two are only temporary. They don't bring any fruit uh, to maturity. But the fourth represents that work of the Holy Spirit who, when He enters the soul, changes our lives for the good and for good. You see, we're no longer what we were before. We are different. We're new creatures. We are becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this morning, we're going to look at what some of those changes are what the good soil looks like, what's true of those who belong to the Lord's family. Basically, we're going to look at three things, that we will support His work, that we will study His Word and we'll hold on to it fast, and we will practice what we learn. So the first change we see in verses 1 through 3, if we belong to the Lord, we will support His work. Let me read verses, those verses again. Luke writes this, Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. Now, in Luke's gospel, this hasn't happened yet, but when Jesus later sends his disciples out to preach, he's going to give them certain instructions, and among them this in Matthew 10, verses 9 and 10. He says, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts. In other words, don't take any cash with you. Or a bag for your journey. Don't bring basically any food. Or even two coats. Don't bring additional clothing. I mean, think about going on a trip. Is this something you would normally do? <laughs> no. Okay. Or sandals or a staff. Why? For the worker is worthy of his support. Jesus is saying, as you go out, you need to be dependent upon those uh, to whom you're ministering, those who receive you. 
Paul is later also going to defend his right to do the same thing to the Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? And then in a few later verses, Do you not know that those who perform the sacred services eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Now, the point is this, that the ministry is often a call to full-time service. And those who are involved in it typically don't have the time or the energy to do that work as well as support themselves and others that may be dependent upon them. Well, the same thing was, was true of our Lord Jesus, wasn't it? I mean, he was in full-time ministry. And he was essentially setting here the pattern. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus became poor in the sense of the incarnation, uh, enjoying, as it were, the riches of heaven. He took on the poverty of, of humanity and was born in a very poor state. And in that state, as he embarks on his ministry, he had to depend on others for his support. The first person he depended on, of course, was his father. His father would meet his needs, but the way he would meet his needs was through his followers. Paul writes this in Galatians 6, verse 6. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Now, I told you before that uh, one thing that is unique about Luke's gospel is that he tends to center on the women who are involved in the life of Jesus. And here we see that very thing taking place. Here we see Mary Magdalene, which essentially means Mary from the city of Mag Magdala, which is a town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, from whom Jesus delivered seven demons, basically uh, exercised those demons out of her, set her free. We see Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and we really don't know much about her beyond what we read here, except that she was one of the women to whom our Lord appears at the resurrection. And we see Susanna. We don't know anything about her at all, except that her name appears right here, and perhaps also the fact that she, along with Joanna and uh, Mary Magdalene and these many others who are mentioned here, not by name, were delivered, were healed, were, were saved by Jesus. And so they were now all ministering to Jesus, supporting him from their private means in order to show their love for him and for his kingdom. You know, A.T. Robertson, I, I've mentioned him before, the one who wrote the largest Greek grammar that uh, I think is known to man. A Greek scholar calls them, and I think rightly so, the first women's missionary society for the support of missionaries of the gospel because that's who Jesus and his disciples were. And they were raising support. They were raising money to, to help him do this work. One of the fruits or one of the results of receiving God's word in a good and honest heart is that we will do also what we can to support what the Lord is continuing to do through his church today. Essentially, we will contribute what the Lord has given to us, a portion of what he has given to us as a part of our stewardship. We will give that to him to support this work so it can move forward. And even though it's not mentioned here, we will also pray. We will ask the Father for his blessing on his son's kingdom. We'll do that knowing that this is essentially how the Lord has ordained that the work of the kingdom move forward. Uh, it, it's not going to advance unless it has the means to advance, and it's not going to be blessed unless we ask for the Lord's blessing. We might tend to think, you know, well, God has an interest in this anyway. Why do I need to ask him? Why do I need to pray? Well, we need to because God has commanded us to pray 
And he's told us things aren't going to move forward unless we do pray. This is a part of the means that God uses. He wants his people to be concerned and interested and to love his son enough to want to see his son's honor advanced in the world through the proclamation of the gospel. So that's one of the things that will be true of us. We will have that kind of heart if we have received the word of God in this Basically, this, this good and honest heart that Jesus is talking about in the parable of the sower. Now, the second change or the second fruit we'll see is in verses 16 through 18, which really contains a lot of things, but I want to focus on just one. And that is we will listen to his word and receive that word, and we will continue to grow in our understanding of that word. Uh, listen to what Jesus says in these three verses, particularly in the last of these three. Now, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Now, real quickly, Jesus here is using the image of a lamp to describe conversion, I think. The conversion of his disciples, but also our conversion, anyone who comes to faith in Jesus. Jesus lights us up. We're like lamps that are, that are basically dark before he comes to us. And he lights us up with his word and with his Holy Spirit. He makes us to be like him so that we might shine in a certain sense. Now, the reason he did this was to save us, of course, to make us trophies of his grace, to have mercy on us because of his great love. But he also did this so that we might share his truth, that we might share his gospel with others. And I think that's what he has in mind by shining the light. You know, we are to be sowers in the field. Uh, We've been looking at that in the evening service, remember? Looking at uh, how are we to communicate Christ in a world that essentially is is unchristian and and pagan. Uh, And we're going to, as I've already mentioned, focus on this a little bit more perhaps next week as we consider the fact that we are to be sowing. But let me just draw this particular point out. To do this effectively, to shine effectively with the character of Jesus and with his truth, we need to know the truth, don't we? We need to learn more of that truth. Jesus says in verse 18, Take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Jesus was at that time teaching his disciples, and he's telling them to listen and to listen carefully and to hold on to what it is he was entrusting to them so that they might eventually shine that light or share that truth with others. Now, Jesus was telling them that if they listen carefully and hold on to that truth, he would entrust more truth to them. For to whoever has to him shall more be given. Well, certainly it's not going to be just more truth. It's going to be more of the influence of the Holy Spirit, perhaps more reward in heaven and so forth, but certainly true that if we want to know more of God's truth, we have to hold on to what we hear, right? Right? So, again, if we want to grow in grace, if we want to be the disciple that our Lord gave us, basically the example of um, the disciple is one who has a ready ear and a listener to what his master is teaching him, we need to listen and we need to hold on to what he gives us. And if we do, the Lord will entrust to us more. But we also have to bear in mind that there was one among the disciples who didn't have who didn't have the Spirit and basically, therefore, had no desire for the truth. And I think you know that that was Judas. Jesus is saying not only would he not be given more, but he also says this, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Now, that doesn't apply just to Judas, obviously. That applies to everyone uh, who is described by the first three soils in the parable of the sower, right? To, to everyone who falls in those categories of the hard, basically the hard soil, the stony soil, the thorny soil. Uh, those are the ones who hear 
but don't benefit at all from the seed that was sown, who don't hold on to it, and what they have, they eventually lose. If we are the good soil, we will listen to what Jesus says, and we'll want to know more of it. We'll have a heart to, to study and to learn. We'll take advantage of those opportunities where we actually can learn more, and we'll be careful to hold on to it, not let it go. Store that word up in our hearts. Remember what was said about the, uh, the forest soil? He hears the word in a good and honest heart, and he holds it fast. That's what we will do because we love the word of God. We treasure this truth. We know that it will show us how to honor the Lord. So to whoever has shall more be given. You want to grow in knowledge? Then hold on to what you have and listen to what he's telling you and don't let go of it. Now, the reason why we want this, as I've already mentioned, is that we might serve him better. And this, I think, is the third and final change that we see in verses 19 through 21. Now, let me read that to you again. And his mother and his brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now, I hope you see the connection between those who were his mothers and brothers and the good soil of the parable because they're the same group of people. Now, Mark tells us that this event takes place in Nazareth. That's Jesus' hometown. Jesus had come back to his hometown to preach. And remember, a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And apparently, at this time, not even among his own family members, including Mary, when his mother, Mary, and his half-brothers, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, heard he was there, they came to take him home because they thought he had lost his senses. Now, that isn't in Luke's gospel, but it is in, in Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 3. But when they came to basically uh, to, to lay hold of him, you know, the word means to arrest him, uh, to, to basically get him to stop and, and take him into custody... Uh, they weren't able to get to him because of the crowd. So the crowd then begins to go through the crowd. It finally gets to Jesus. Those around Jesus tells him that his family are outside wanting to see him. Jesus asks this question in, in Mark 3. Who are my mother and my brothers? And then he answers that in Mark 3 and in Luke 8. He answered, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now, at this time, we know that his mother was certainly a believer, Mary, but his brothers were not yet believing, although they would later believe. And I don't think Jesus' point was not that Mary and, and these brothers of his were not his family. I mean, they were, certainly Mary was. But his point was that his family is more expansive than just his natural family. His family includes everyone who will listen to his word and do what it says. Remember, it's not enough to listen. It's not enough to hear and to know. We must do what we say. That's what James reminds us of. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the half-brothers of our Lord in, in the, who writes the epistle of James. And he tells us this very thing. You know, don't go away being forgetful hearers, but be effectual doers of the word. If we are members of his family, if we are those who fall into that fourth category, then we will do His Word by His grace because that's what the Spirit of God does in us. He produces fruit. That's what characterizes a true believer. That's what distinguishes the fourth soil is that it bears fruit and that is the fruit, of course, of the, uh, the Spirit's character He's working in us is the fruit of love and everything that pours out of that. Remember, love is the only thing we need, love for the Lord and His holiness. Now, in closing, let me just apply this briefly in two ways. First of all, we need to ask the question, do these things that describe the four soil and members of the family of our Lord Jesus Christ, do these things describe you? Do they describe me? We need to ask ourselves these questions. Do we love Jesus? Are we committed to supporting the work of his kingdom through our giving and through our prayers and actually are we doing that? Are we studying the Word of God? 
holding on to what it is we learn, you know, being, and, and basically doing what it says, becoming effectual doers and not forgetful hearers. Well, if these things do describe us, then we are a part of Jesus' family. Uh, we are a part of that category of the good soil. The Lord has had mercy on us by His Holy Spirit. But if this doesn't describe you, if this is not what your life is characterized by, if this isn't the practice of your life, then you need to turn away from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You still need Jesus. So this is a way we can test whether or not we know Him. Are we bearing fruit and specifically these fruits? Although, let me just mention, if we were to basically look at all the fruits of, that that love produces in the life, we would be here for the rest of our lives reading from the Scriptures what that looks like. But I can summarize it in one word. It looks like Jesus, okay? It looks like the way He lived because He is the perfect example. Uh, we need to follow that example at least in those areas where we can follow that example. That's what the Spirit of God produces is a love for that kind of life. But secondly, I think we would all admit that none of us are doing what we should be doing in these particular areas. Loving Jesus as we should love Him, uh, supporting His work and studying His Word and doing what He calls us to do. So let's be encouraged this morning by the reminder of these particular items to improve in these areas that we might receive a greater reward, but more importantly, that we might honor the one whom we love more than anyone else, and that is the Lord Jesus, that he might be honored, that the Father might be honored. And let me just encourage you again to use the opportunities that the Lord has given to us to learn. You know, we, we have several things that we're doing today and, and through the week, and all of these things are going to add to our store of knowledge and enable us to do more of what the Lord calls us to do, let me encourage you to come this evening to listen to the video lecture because we need to ask ourselves this question. If you're confronted with one of the many pagan pagans in our society, I know that sounds kind of harsh, but a pagan simply means somebody that's really not a Christian, right? And that's essentially what they are. So when you're confronted with somebody who's an atheist, somebody who, who believes in evolution in millions of years, do you know how to, how to confront that? Do you know how to defend what the Bible says against the so-called teachings of science in this particular area of millions of years? Well, you know, it's exactly what Andrew Snowing is going to show us this evening. Uh, it's something you don't hear every day, and we don't always have this opportunity but this is the day the Lord wants us to rest from the things we're doing out, outside in the world so that we can focus on the very things that our Lord tells us should characterize us as Christians to store up, you know, what it is He has to teach us so that we'll be able better to serve Him in the world. Well, if you do have that, um, that opportunity, if you can come this evening, I would encourage you to come and, and to learn and to be equipped. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, basically apply His Word to our hearing, as, uh, our lives as we need to this morning.